بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي ونسلم على رسوله الكريم أما بعد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد وبارك وسلم اللهم يسر ولا تعسر وتم بالخير وبك نستعين يا فتاح يا فتاح While waiting for the slides to load insha'Allah the background of this is now we have reached the 10th year of prophethood that means from the bi'atha of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was granted the mantle of nubuwa and prophethood and we come to a critical time as Mawlana Suleiman had eloquently explained and this was a culmination of many difficulties torture and persecution it all resulted now finally in the, in the losing of the two great supports of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the, in the form of the demise of Abu Talib and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's beloved wife Khadija radiallahu anha to cut the academics out of it there's a difference of opinion you might have saw in your text they speak about three days difference some say five days some say three months Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best but basically in the tenth year of prophethood these two people uh, they, they they had passed on what is the significance of this when it comes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam let's analyze the type of support that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam enjoyed from these two people to understand and appreciate the type of difficulty and the type of grief that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had to endure because of this. When we look at Abu Talib, some of the speakers had already alluded to this. They came to Abu Talib, sometimes 25 of the most influential people of Mecca came to Abu Talib as a delegation and they said to Abu Talib that hand over Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to us and sometimes he said that we will give you one of our best youngsters you can take him in view of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam but all those times Abu Talib said to them that he will not do so we see that they come to Abu Talib and they say that Ya Abu Talib Inna ibn Akhika Qad sabba alimatana wa abadinana wa saffaha ahlamana wa dallala abaana فإن أن تكفه عنا وإن أن تخلي بيننا وبينه فإنك على مثل ما نحن عليه من خلافه فنكفيك So they said to him that I would talk to you well that your nephew has cursed our idols and our gods and he has criticized our religion and he has regarded our intelligent ones to be, to be, to be stupid and foolish and he has done such and such Either you suffice him or we will have to deal with it. Then you are with him in the same boat. At that time he said, La uslimu ilayka abada. He said to them, after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I don't want to repeat the incident, but the, the, the caption and the statement that was mentioned about the sun being in the right hand and the moon in the left, that he will not forsake the religion, that was in that context. So in that critical time, he said, Abu Talib, after hearing the resolve of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, I will never allow them to take you and I will never surrender him to you. I will never surrender you to them. And he recited some poetry. I have it in the notes. The slides uh, seem not to be uploading. But if you, if you analyze the poetry and I've translated it there for you as well, you'll find it there that he says, in that poetry, he says how much he believes that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is in the right and how much of admiration he has for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he speaks about Fasta, go and preach your religion, proclaim your faith ma alayka ghadadatun there will be no reproach upon you and he tells Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to continue with his mission so we notice in, in Shah Abi Talib was named after him the valley, we heard about that story now there was the, the time that was mentioned how he slept with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was, was made to sleep with him in his bed so that he could protect him all of those sacrifices he made for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and then he 
he passes on. And when he passes on, how does he pass on? What was his demise like? That's also mentioned in the slides. That he comes, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa comes to him. Abu Jahl and some others are there. And they say to uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says to Abu Talib, that just say the kalima la ilaha illallah. Just say it in my ears. So that I can see shafa'a on your behalf. I can intercede on your behalf on the day of Qiyamah. Abu Talib, this is according to, and I've mentioned the scholarly discuss, discussion there. Abu Talib, according to the Sahih narration of Al Bukhari and Muslim, he passed away saying, Ala Milati Abdul Muttali. He passed away saying that he will pass on on the religion of his grand of his father and of his forefathers. So he passed away without accepting Islam. Although there's a narration that has been mentioned about Abbas radiallahu an hearing from Abu Talib that he that he accepted Islam, but that narration cannot stand. When we look at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that I will seek forgiveness for Abu Talib until he is forgiven. The verse was revealed that it is not behoving of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to seek forgiveness for a mushrik. So he did not, so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was prohibited from seeking forgiveness. And this is authentically transmitted. Also what has been mentioned, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Sahih al-Bukhari, the narration is there in your notes, he has mentioned that Abu Talib will be punished to that extent that he will be feel bahbah. Bahbah means shallow water. So he will have a shallow water that is boiled. So up to his ankles he will be punished in the fire. So imagine what pain Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa went through when after repeatedly asking his uncle to, to recite the kalima and after seeing the support from his uncle, what pain it must have been on his heart that his uncle passed away on the Mila and the religion of somebody else and of a Mishri. How difficult it must have been upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then we have Khadija radiallahu anha. When you look at Khadija radiallahu anha, some of the speakers have mentioned and I counted there was four, maybe five times that the ladies were addressed. But this shows us when we come to Khadija radiallahu anha and we talk about the support of Khadija radiallahu anha for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This one hadith that you see in front of you and that you have in your notes as well, this hadith encapsulates the support of Khadija radiallahu anha for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. At a time when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was completely ostracized, ostracized, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was left, was forsaken. He had nothing. At that time, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Aminat bi it kafara bin nas. That she believed in me. When the people disbelieved in me, وَصَدَّقَتْنِي لِكَذَّ بَنِي nas, And she testified to my authenticity. She believed me when the people belied me. وَوَاسَتْنِي بِمَالِهَا إِذْ حَرَمَ nas, And she, she gave me assistance by means of her wealth when the people deprived me of it. وَرَزَقَنِي مِنْهَا اللَّهُ الْوَلَدَ دُونَ غَيْرِهَا مِنَ النِّسَاءِ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had grant me, granted me children from her whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not grant me children from anyone else. So look at that support and that type of, of relationship Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had with his beloved wife. So much so that up till this point Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not marry any other wife. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had that support from both of them. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loses that, those two pillars of support. What great grief it must have been on the heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I come to an important point. And that is, one is we mention the incidents or the facts pertaining to Sirah. But the other is learning from the Sirah. And that was eloquently pointed out by many of the speakers. That is called Fiqh Sirah. The understanding of the Sirah. And the reflection and lessons from the Sirah. There's beautiful books that have been written in this regard. One such book is by Muhammad Sa'id Ramadan al Buti, Rahimahullah, who had passed on from Damascus. I don't want to go into the politics of it, of his name. But he was a great scholar. And I've had the good fortune of meeting him in Damascus, in Jami Umawi. Anyway, he has written this work. And so he explores what is the hikmah? 
How did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam suffer so much and go through this type of anxiety, this type of grief? What is the hikmah? What is the wisdom behind that for the ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? So he mentions, the first point he says, and you can make a note of this, is that da'wah had to be an example and a practical example had to be shown in the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for the skill of da'wah. And this would demand, if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was divinely protected, he was divinely protected against being assassinated and otherwise, but Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went through those three difficult years in the valley of Abu Talib, he witnessed the demise of his support structures. Why? Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam like how he told us, Sallu kama ra'aytu muni usalli. They perform salah like how I perform salah. It's as if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was saying to us, Isbiru kama ra'aytu muni asfir. That be patient like how you see me being patient. Present that in your life. And relate that patience of mine in your life. When you're going to give da'wah to anyone, to the non-Muslims, to Muslims, you're going to face difficulties. And now, if Abu Talib was given life for a longer period, and he had that support who enjoyed the protection of Abu Talib, then people would have said that, see, we can't emulate Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because, Abu Ta- because he had the protection of Abu Talib. He was protected whereas his companions were being persecuted and tortured. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed the greatest of his creation, suffer to a khalq, Habibullah. He allowed all those persecutions, those tortures that you heard about, the incident after the demise of Abu Talib, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was not doing anything, he was reciting salah, performing salah in the haram, and all those things were done to him, so much so that sand was thrown on his, on his face. He comes home, Fatima radiallahu anha, asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, why are they doing this to you, O oh my father? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tolerated that. To show us that we have no excuse in the da'wah to anyone, to the non-Muslims and Muslims. We have no excuse whatsoever. We will endeavor, we will make an effort because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also made that effort. If you face humiliation, if you face disgrace, then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also faced that. He was called names, he was called titles, he was called majnoon, he was called a soothsayer, he was called different titles, but he persevered for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One more point with regards to harm in prison is that the year of grief, when we say it is the year of grief, and this point is also attributed to uh, Shaykh al-Buti, rahimahullah, he has mentioned that when it comes to Amr Huzan, why was the year of grief called the year of grief? Why was it called the year of grief? So we'll say because of the demise of those two supports of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says there's more to it. And again, alluding to this point of da'wah, that the most difficult thing one was to endure to see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa throughout his life, he saw his companions being slaughtered. He saw them being martyred for the sake of Allah. But worse was to see the da'wah and the flag of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not being raised high. So now there were impediments for the da'wah. After the, the demise of Abu Talib, it was difficult for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There were no impediments for the da'wah. And therefore, there was grief upon grief. One was the demise of these two people, but also was the, the sort of the slowdown of the da'wah to Islam. Now we come to the journey of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to Taif. And again, this was in the same year. And this would also indicate to us the difficulty that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went through to let Islam reach everyone. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left for Taif when he became a bit despondent about the people in Mecca. He told him to go out. And Taif is not very far from Mecca to Mukarram, as many of us may know. You can see in the map, just about 50 or 60 kilometers out from there. He went to Taif with the intention of giving da'wah to the people and to the sons of Amr. But, of course, we know the story that he was met with much difficulty, he was met with abuse, etc. This again, the 
I think the greatest lesson that we can take from the story of Taif is this point here. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after being mocked at Jared, after being stoned, after his shoes, his blessed shoes were filled with his blood, he retires to an orchard that actually belonged to his cousins, and they were non-Muslims. But even they felt pity in their hearts, and they sent Abbas to him, they sent the, the, the Christian slave to him to give him some grapes. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had a chance, and there's a difference of opinion when this dua was made or when this intija, we don't even call it a dua. It was, it was a sort of a private com- communication of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with his beloved Allah. He says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allahumma ilayka ashku, du'fa quwwati wa qilla tahilati wa hawani ala nas. What would we do when we face difficulty, when we face failure? We attribute it to different causes. We start pushing around blame. Rasulullah says to Allah, O oh Allah, and remember, he went out for 10 days, he gave da'wah to the people of Taif. He withstood their oppression and their perse- persecution and he tolerated it for 10 days, 10 solid days. And now he turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he says, O oh Allah, ilayka ashku tu'fa quwwati. Allah, I am weak. My resources are scarce. My planning was wrong. And perhaps my humiliation is due to my own personal profile. Ya Arhamar Rahimin, Anta Arhamar Rahimin, Ila Min Takini, Ila Adumi Mitajahamuni, Aw Ila Tarihu Malatahu Amri, Illam Takum Alayka Zabbanan, Sala Ulali. He says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, O oh Allah, to whom? Are you surrendering me? Are you surrendering, surrendering me to an enemy that will frown at me? Or are you surrendering, surrendering me to a close relative of mine that you have completely handed me over to? And this is what a beautiful statement. Rasulullah says, and this we can relate to, whenever we go through difficulty, whenever we face failure, and remember, we are never lazy as Muslims. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went the extra mile Allah tabakhim on nafsaka Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not only fulfill his task but he went the extra mile but yet he says so humbly that this was his scarcity of resources this was his ill planning and he says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is what we must remember that if after doing what was right and we exploited the resource, resources at our exposure at, at our disposal and we use whatever we could for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if all fails then as long as ilam takum there's different narrations here as well and different wordings is a bit of a mistake here in the text but ilam takum alayka ghubbanan O Allah if you are not angry upon me then fala ubani then I don't care O Allah if it is not your anger that brought about this then I don't care, Ya Allah. And then he says, But I am weak. Ghayra anna afiyataka awsa'uni. Look at how Rasulullah teaches us to deal with these type of situations. Rasulullah is telling us that you don't ask for difficulties, you ask for ease. He says, Oh Allah, ease is afiyah, well being, is better for me. And then he says, He makes a beautiful dua. He says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, أعوذ بنور وجهك الذي أشرقت له الظلمات وصلح عليه أمر الدنيا والآخرة أن تنزل به غضبة أو تحل عليه سقطة لك العتبة حتى ترضى أو الله Look at these words لك العتبة حتى ترضى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم تازل الله سبحانه وتعالى That oh Allah I will stand at your door I will knock at your door I will seek your penance and I will seek forgiveness from you oh Allah until you are happy oh Allah the word utba means to come back and again, to come back to the person that you have harmed. Come back to the person that you have angered and ask them to forgive you and ask them to overlook you. Or this torture, all this difficulty, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you can read about the incident of Adas in Surah Al-Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you can learn about how he accepted Islam. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and that's, we can learn a lesson from that. That sometimes we think that 
we, we want to go for the bigger gun. You know the Fritz, one pers person mentioned to me, a business person mentioned this to us. He said sometimes we look at those high, those fruits above on the top of the tree. And we aim for those fruits. That's a very good thing. We should do that. But sometimes it's easier we overlook those fruits that are right by us. They're close to us. They're hanging down there. They're dangling in front of us. So your Rasulullah did not come right with the chieftains of Baif. But he came right with Adas. And Adas immediately believed in him. And he was the servant of the enemies of Rasulullah wasallam. And to culminate that. And this was Rasulullah wasallam's compassion. This was the character of Rasulullah wasallam. After being persecuted. After being tortured. After being taunted. Rasulullah wasallam was now approached by Malakul Jibal. By the angel of the mountains. And the angel of the mountains said to him. O Rasul of Allah, I am the angel of the mountains. If you wish, if you feel that I want to crush those two mountains, there was a mountain of Mecca, of course, and the mountain that was on the other side of Taif, I can crush the people of Taif in between these two mountains for you. What did Rasulullah say? بَلْ أَرْجُوا أَنْ يُخْرِجَ اللَّهُ مِنْ أَصْلَابِهِمْ May Ya'bud Allah Wahda, may Ya'bud Allah Wahda, La Yushriku Bihi Shay'a. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Put ourselves in his shoes, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What would we have said? Let's take sweet revenge. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, That no, I don't desire this. I desire and I hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take out from their loins those who will worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This should be, again, our nature, and especially in the path of Allah, in the path of Allah, in doing the work of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in preaching the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we will tolerate persecution, we will tolerate humiliation, but we will always have a positive outlook, we will always be aspiring for the belief of those people, we will not stop our da'wah upon their taunting. We will not stop our da'wah upon their humiliation. And we will continue, like how we saw in the stories that have been mentioned in Umar radiallahu story, that it will always end up in a good ending. So, after these difficulties, the, 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 the year of grief and the incident of Taif, now Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has, it, it is as if, and this point has been mentioned in Siratul Mustafa, uh, because there's a difference of opinion with regards to the date that the Isra and the Mi'raj occurred. But in Sirat al-Mustafa, Mulana Idris Kandahlawi rahimahullah has chosen to mention it after Taif and after Amul Huzn. And he has supporting narrations to back him up for that. Why did he choose to do so? He wanted to mention a very important point. And that is that after every difficulty comes ease. And that was mentioned by our honorable MC as well. That after every difficulty will come ease. But look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. After all that difficulty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes him to a point where no one, no creation of Allah can surpass that point. Siddhartul Muntaha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from Mukhtul Mukarrama to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa and then from Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa to the seven heavens right up to the point of Sidrat Al-Muntaha and Rasulullah فَقَابَ الْقَوْسِنِي أَوْ أَدْنَا فَأُوحَى إِلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ مَا أُوحَى What a beautiful experience that he said to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the day he was taken where Jibreel alayhi wa sallatu wa sallam said O Rasul of Allah I cannot I cannot pass by this point it is only you that has been given permission to pass by this point. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam whatever he needed to reveal to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There's much that we can say with regards to the Isra and the Mi'raj. We can speak about the fact that it was Birruh and Jasad that in one night, if it was just a dream that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had seen, then it wouldn't have been some spectacular miracle. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not have started the 15 Jews with this verse that you see in front of you by the word subhan that means glorified be Allah Allah will not have started it like this and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not have mentioned it in this way but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions it in this way subhanahu 
glorifying himself by the ascension of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the isra of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, showing us that these were miraculous feats that Allah subhanahu wa taala had the power to do this for Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Asra bi abdihi layla that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was taken. Asra bi abdihi layla. Asra means to take at night, and then Allah mentions layla to show us in one night and in the portion of a night. Allah subhanahu wa taala takes Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam on this miraculous journey to such great lengths of the heavens. So the point that we learn is also the point of tasdeeq. That is the point, a point of affirmation, and that as Muslims we surrender to Islam wholeheartedly. Abu Bakr radhiyallahu anhu, when the people were disbelieving in this in this incident and they were mocking and jeering at this incident, and it was proven to them. The Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam travel. He he brought for them proofs. But Abu Bakr radhiyallahu anhu, what did he ask? He asked, "Did my Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam say this?" He said, "Yes." He said, "In kana kama qal." Then he says, "If it is like our Rasulullah, if it is like that, then I believe in it. And it is not difficult for me to believe in this because I believe in him in things that are more than this, things that are greater than this. And that should be the spirit of a believer. That." We make the steel, and we believe in whatever comes to us from the Sharia, from the Quran and Sunnah. If it is authentically transmitted to us, and the scholars, may Allah Subhanahu wa Taala bless them, they have, they they endeavoured to protect our legacy. They protected our legacy by means of the Isnad system, which is unique to the Muslims. It is not found amongst any other religion. We have this Isnad system, which protected our Deen. This chain of transmission, where every single narrator was graded and they were vetted before the narrations were taken. We come across another point. I'm just going to choose from here. We come across another point, and that is that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in this blessed journey, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was given a choice. Point number two on the slide. That Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was given a choice between two vessels. Vessels. And one was filled with milk, and the other one was filled with wine. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam opted immediately for the vessel of milk, showing us that the deen of Islam is deen of fitra. It is a natural inclination and a disposition towards Islam, towards that which is good. That means in all the commands of Allah subhanahu wa taala, in all the laws of Sharia, there is only good, and it is in sync with our natural disposition. If a person feels uncomfortable with any law of the Sharia, then there's a problem with that person's disposition. It means that there has been some change with regards to his disposition. He was by default disposed towards good, but there was some outside interference and influence, and that person has a problem, and that person needs to sort themselves out. That is what we learn from from that incident. Also, in closure. We learn that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, besides being taken to the heavens and beyond, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was made to meet the Anbiya alim musallatu wasallam and made to meet the prophets. All of them, all, all the major prophets, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam met them also to console him, to show him that in your path, in fulfilling your task, you will also face. Difficulties of Adam, the difficulties, the challenges that were faced by Yahya and Isa alayhi musallatu wasallam, by Yusuf alayhi musallatu wasallam, by Idris, Harun, Musa, and Ibrahim alayhi musallatu wasallam. You take the the test. You will be tested with regards to uh, with regards to beauty. You will be tested with regards to pride and arrogance. You will be tested with regards to people, uh, you know, over. Uh, Taking you and putting you over the pedestal of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and over exaggerating your rank, and you will also face the difficulties that Musa alayhi salatu wasalam faced, and Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. In uh, Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says, "Waibtala Ibrahim Rabbu bi kalimatin fatamahun." That means that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala tested Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam in many different ways. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala tested him where to lead his family in the barren des- desert of Mecca to Al-Mukarramah. He tested him that he had to sacrifice his own son. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will also test you that you will fulfill all those tasks 
and you will uh, pass your examinations. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us tawfiq and allow us to imbibe the lessons that we learn from the seerah and to assimilate with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.